Okay. Um, in the medical ethics conversation in the West, there's often a very significant focus on this idea of autonomy. And it's a very important and understandable idea. Uh, it deals with the, the primarily, I guess, with the doctor-patient relationship. This kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship where the physician is the patient advocate and the needs of the patient are the things that take priority. And so, in the West, we've developed a very good conversation around this idea of autonomy and promoting the autonomous individual and decision-making in that context. What the faith traditions uh, offer us, which I think is a good addition to this very important conversation on autonomy in medical ethics, um, and I take this quote from the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, is this idea of the common good, which creates a particular space in which autonomous individuals work out their life. So, this idea of the common good in the Catholic tradition uh, requires the social well-being and development of the group itself. So there, there is a sense in which many faith traditions, and the Catholic tradition here in particular, um, are very concerned, are as concerned with the health of the group as much as they are with the health of the individual. And I think that creates part of the context for the kinds of things I'd like to say this evening. And as with any ethical obligation, uh, it speaks about this participation. I'm not sure why it's A little bit on this idea of the common good and the way in which um, in this first quote that I'm offering here speaks about conversations, community conversations and the requirement for conversion. And so when communities come together in an effort to promote the common good, they also need to, I think, in the best possible scenario, to be open to this, <coughs> excuse me, this idea of conversion. And so you bring what you understand to the conversation, but having been in conversation with your dialogue partners, you are open to conversion, to knowing more than you did before you met, and uh, therefore to move forward in a richer context than before. Okay, um, one of the gifts that I'd like to just underscore as one that the Catholic community um, can bring into this conversation is this idea of ecumenical dialogue. And the reason for focusing on this idea is that it's one that the church has, has affirmed as a part of the way the church is in the world. And so for a long time, but in particular for the last 50 years, say, since Vatican II, the church has, in fact, professed this um, awareness of a need for dialogue with people who have a slightly different starting position. So in the ecumenical dialogue and in the interfaith conversation. This is particularly about the ecumenical dialogue, but I would also say it's the interfaith conversation. And I think this is useful in the idea of the science and faith conversation. So that uh, I think that having walked this journey in a particular way for the last 50 years, that the church has in fact developed some very particular resources that it can bring to this science and faith conversation. And these resources come out of the tradition of the ecumenical Bible. Okay. Um, one of the things I'd like to say is that then if you are going to be involved in a project of dialogue, you want to know what you bring to the table. And so we learned this in ecumenical dialogue, and I think it's something we need to keep in mind in the science and religion <coughs> dialogue conversation. So I think in our tradition, what we need to bring to the table is our understanding of what it means to declare that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. 
I think we also need to bring to the table our understanding of what it means to be living in a community and living under the care of a, of a loving, forgiving, faithful God. I also think we need to stress that we live in a world that has its own life and that we want to be gentle enough, we want to walk gently in the world so that the earth survives our relationship and that we have something to hand on to other generations. Okay. Um, so I've just um, offered some of the things that I think that the faith communities need to bring to the table. This is a science and religion dialogue. I'd like to speak just briefly, at least from the point of view of the life sciences, some of the things, some of the perspectives that the life sciences are going to bring to the table. And uh, I brought this slide of Charles Darwin, the Darwin year, which was 2009. That marked the 150th anniversary of the publication of the book, The Origin of the Species, which I think has had a profound impact on Western thought. It's also the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. Um, as a geneticist, I don't take a breath without presuming that evolution is more or less correct. There's lots of details to work on, lots of internal discussions about what certain things mean about evolution, but evolution is a powerful um, idea and it has a tremendous explanatory value for the things that we see in the lab. One of the other things I'd like to underscore as a much more recent arrival on the scene than the origin of the species, which um, I just mentioned with Charles Darwin, is this idea of the human genome project. So in the early um, part of this century, of 2000 to 2003, there were a number of publications which announced the sequencing of the human genome. That put a powerful new um, data set in the hands of the life sciences and a powerful new um, set of technology in uh, the hands of science and, and medicine. We're just beginning to understand what this new knowledge means for us. I mean, I think we can think of the human genome as perhaps an ancient manuscript that we discovered in a language that we don't understand, and it has no punctuation marks. And then we could also recognize that we can read the text from front to back and back to front. So it's a big text. It's got three billion letters in it. Uh, and so it's going to take us a while to figure out what it means, but it is powerful and I can't imagine any more exciting time in the history of science to be a geneticist than now because of this human genome project. And it is changing the conversation. 